So you good? Live? That? We're live? Good morning. <laughs> I want to welcome you here today. We have a couple of announcements to uh, get started with. Uh, first off, we are hoping that the building doesn't fall in and show need for the hard hat Josiah was just wearing. Well, secondly, uh, next Sunday already, is we're celebrating 60 years as a church. Uh, we will be having the Wright family, Peter Wright and his wife and his daughter and her brother. Um, Josiah, Josiah, our little Josiah, texts Josiah Wright, a college student, Josh, that's what I meant, Josiah, Josh, uh, when we first brought the girls to campus, he left us where we were eating on, on campus and moved down the table to sit by Josh, spent the whole lunch period just jabbering away. So uh, he has got the inside intel that Josh will be here. Um, so with that being said... Um, if anybody is interested in bringing any like snacky foods, guy type snacky foods, um, we could have a little bag for Josh as well. Uh, we weren't for sure whether or not he was coming. It was sounding pretty likely that he wouldn't be able to come. And uh, per information this morning, it sounds like he will be. So if, if that is a possibility, uh, we would like to be able to maybe offer him something as well since his mom and sister will also be getting some things. And uh, so if you're interested in that, obviously that'll be next Sunday already, so we don't have a lot of time with that. In conjunction with that, uh, we are also collecting things for uh, Hunter Savinsky uh, for a kind of a back-to-college slash birthday uh, package. Uh, there at Bob Jones, <laughs> my daughters got him some Maranatha things. I put it back there. Yeah, it's all back there. And we got him a, a, like a promo, like why he should go to Maranatha, kind of little pamphlet thing and uh, so we're expecting some good responses from this uh, there at Bob Jones uh, but if you're interested in doing that we need to send that off this week probably about midweek I would guess at the latest so if you would still like to add something to uh, the the Savinsky package <laughs> uh, talk to my wife so she is aware so we won't ship it until that all arrives 
Uh, otherwise, probably Tuesday, Wednesday-ish, we'll probably be sending that off. And uh, his birthday is next Monday, so we would like to just get it there by then. Um, but anyway, we're hoping for some good chuckles as well with the Maranatha items uh, there in Brent. Allegedly, and this is what he has told us, is the staff evangelist at Maranatha, and he sent his son to Bob Jones. And so we're just trying to point out some discrepancies here that this isn't, it's not meshing with how things are going there. Nonetheless, the, so two, two guy collections here this next week, or for Hunter, next day or two, uh, for Josh, or as he's often called, Buddy, Buddy Wright, uh, we have until next Sunday. Uh, if you are going to get Josh something, and it's going to be big, I guess let my wife know, because uh, we're going to have a bag, and uh, obviously if she brings a small bag and there's a a big box of whatever, uh, we just want to coordinate that. So anyway, uh, if you can just coordinate with my wife, I'll say it this way, coordinate with my wife for both of those, and uh, we'll, we'll work our way through that. But more importantly, we're looking forward to the 60th uh, church anniversary, um, 60 years well beyond my time frame, uh, and uh, just going to look back at uh, some of those things that the Lord has done. Looking forward to having the rights here, and uh, I do not recall what he said he was going to be going over, um, but they do like character studies in message and song, and uh, looking forward to that. And then uh, we'll have a meal downstairs, some turkey, I believe, and uh, the sides, and then uh, we'll stay downstairs and uh, probably sing a number of songs and uh, maybe do a little... Uh, well, this kind of fun things, uh, uh, maybe a little quiz about our church history, and then uh, as well, what else did I say? Uh, maybe just some, his, just some more history aspects of, of those 60 years, things that the Lord has done uh, over 60 years. And so we encourage you to stay for that here next week. We encourage you to come for that, and then as well, if you have opportunity to invite others as well for that, uh, certainly we would love to be able to have people there as uh, they are here, and uh, we are looking forward to that. The very next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll have a business meeting. After our lunch time frame downstairs, we'll have a business meeting downstairs, and uh, I don't expect it to be long, kind of just the, like, the required quarterly meeting, and so all the normal, the minutes and the finances and all that, and uh, probably some discussion in regards to uh, our Halloween event as well as the Christmas walk that they have downtown, and um, that may be about it. But anyway, that's coming up here very shortly as well. Um, I guess that's about it. November, again, we're going to announce this early. I know it's only September right now, but October will be here by the end of this week. And uh, November then is short there on the horizon. But we, have, we would like to have our Thanksgiving service, Lord willing, on that Tuesday night before Thanksgiving as we have in the past. And uh, that is kind of a, we encourage you to be a part of the service. I don't have a message per se. Uh, we just gather together, and as I've kind of coined it in the last several years, it's kind of like a, a family gathering around the piano. Not that everything's about the piano, uh, but it's just a time of testimony, a time of singing, a time of uh, sharing with what God has done for us. And I always try to give you plenty of a notice, because we don't want to gather everybody on that Tuesday night, and then there's just crickets. Um, and so if you could be thinking along those lines, I've probably shared this test or, uh, illustration many years now, but Mr. Cole, back in his prime, would literally come with books. He would come in with like five books stacked up. And, uh, you know, back in January, I was reading this, and I wanted to read you this paragraph. And back in this, and this is what the Lord did. And, and uh, it was always classic because his book, stack of books, would, would, would rise pretty high in the pew next to him. And, and uh, he'd get the floor, and he had the floor for quite some time. Um, but anyway, he was, he was a well-prepared man uh, back in, in his prime before his health started failing. And uh, so I want to give you, not that you have to come with a whole library of books to read, um, but to give you opportunities to come prepared to just give thanks and kind of more of a family setting and uh, looking forward to that. Am I missing anything? Friday, if you are interested, and in, we can maybe post this later, uh, obviously the Maranatha cross-country team will be in, is it Moline? Augustana, Rock Island. Rock Island, wherever Augustana is. Uh, it almost seems like it was a golf course, if I recall. Was it a golf course? Anyway, college. But I mean, it seems like that the actual cross country might have been on the, on the golf course. Yes, it's the college, yes. But anyway, Caitlin uh, will be obviously on that team. 
And uh, if you're interested in watching that, uh, she will be running her little heart out, probably with a smile. As it seems like the coach always gets her picture with a smile as she's running. Everybody else is puking their guts out, and Caitlin just runs by with a big smile. <laughs> I'm not sure how she does that. Um, but anyway, that'll be this Friday. If you want more information or details, we can get that to you. We might just post the directions or where it is uh, there on Friday, Friday evening sometime. Yes. Today, so. Yes. Other than that, I think I think that is it. As far as some prayer requests, uh, we have our our prayer app, and here's what's on the app as of right now. Some specifics I wanted to uh, mention. First off, Barb there towards the bottom. Uh, she is as of was it Thursday last Thursday I believe um, was sent home from Springfield, basically on hospice. The hospital said there's nothing more we can do. And uh, they do not expect it, perhaps, to, to, to be very long. Uh, but certainly a continued prayer request for her and her husband and the, the entirety of the church. Uh, I mentioned last week that I was talking to one of the church members, and one of the things that she said at the time in regards to insurance was that as a church, this is the first time they've ever had to, you know, she said we've never had to deal with the loss of a, a minister or a minister's wife, and this is, this is not easy for us. And so certainly pray for those involved with the church as well and, and uh, be in prayer for Barb. And then Caitlin added, was that Friday, Josiah Cochran. If you've ever been to Princeville Baptist, uh, not Princeville, uh, Chillicothe Baptist, um, Pastor Cochran is the pastor there. He, if, you've, if you know him or you've talked to him for more than five seconds, you know that boy is from the, the deep south. He's from Georgia, and uh, there is no hiding the fact that he's from Georgia. When I saw the name, I thought, oh, that must be a, a relation. Well, this Cochran is from Canada, and from my daughter's explanation, there is no hiding the fact that they're from Canada. So th there is likelihood that they may still be related, because that's not seemingly a very common last name, but uh, one is definitely Georgia, and one is definitely Canada. Uh, but anyway, it's on the uh, cross-country team, and I don't know any of the extra details, but he literally sent a, a message to all of his teammates and said, can you please share this with all of your churches because this is very, very serious right now. And that's really all we know. And uh, so Josiah Cochran's aunt, Josiah Cochran being a Maranatha student, and uh, I would assume aunt is in Canada. I, I don't know. But any other uh, prayer requests that we'd like to add? Yeah, it so seems that way. Right yes. Now, I don't no remember what it was, but I just this last week something was going on with Australia, and I forget what it was. Was it major lockdowns? Yeah, it may have, that may have been what I was hearing. Wow. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Still. No, so she called her surgeon's office and the nurse said that she personally had gone and talked to the doctor about this situation. The doc the way Marlene explained it was, I guess now the doctor is involved. So hopefully she'll hear something this week. Wow. No. Yes. Let's certainly pay for her. And that was in the hospital all last week and she's in a rehab nursing home place now. And it doesn't sound really good. A lot of her relatives have come in. So continue to pay for her and her dad. She was hoping to be able to go where her dad is, but she couldn't. Oh wow. Yes. Huh. And Bill is kind of discouraged. I think this year he has spent more time in the hospital than he has been out. 
Yes. 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 Anybody else? Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Do look. Oh, I saw a hand. Yes. Very good. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for who you are, for your goodness, for your mercy. We thank you that uh, beyond our means, beyond our certainly ever even deserving it, that you are always there with us, alongside of us, uh, come what may. And uh, I thank you for that. We do certainly do pray for the specifics request here mentioned this morning. Yes, that you be with Barb there across town and home from the hospital and, and told that there's nothing more that they can do. And, and uh, certainly as her husband and the church surround her, I just pray that you would certainly direct hearts to you, that you would um, remind all involved of your continuous grace and your continuous goodness, uh, even in the unknown, even in uh, some, as man would call it, dire circumstances. I just pray that you be with Barb and encourage her heart as well. So we need to pray for Josiah Cochran's aunt. Don't know any other details, even her name. Uh, but you certainly are very aware. And uh, I just ask that whatever these complications are with the pregnancy that sound very serious, I just pray that uh, you would give that grace, that you give direction as decisions are made, and, and uh, just that you would be honored through this. And, and again, I don't know the details, but we have great confidence that you are fully aware of, of all that's taking place. Pray that you be with Marlene and certainly just the frustration, the potentially anxiety involved with uh, now going a month and not hearing any response back. I, I just pray that you would calm some nerves, but even more specifically that, that you just enable her to be able to get some answers this week if possible. And uh, I, I just pray that in any decisions that are directly related that you would guide there as well. But I pray that even today uh, that you give her a peace that passes all understanding rooted solely in you. And for Annette, we certainly do ask that you continue to give her the strength that she needs, certainly the encouragement that she needs, certainly a desire to, to be there by her dad and, and not able to as they're in different facilities. Uh, but I pray that you would certainly give direction as they are and can continue to monitor them, them both and as well make decisions appropriately. And I pray that they would both be reminded, both Annette and her dad, of of your presence and uh, know that they are being prayed for. So we need to pray for Bill Price as well as uh, he is back in the hospital and, and certainly discouraged and uh, I pray that you would love to uplift his heart and as well just that they be able to resolve this infection and be able to get him back on the road to recovery and back home. And uh, for uh, uh, certainly for Michael and this need with uh, the disability and all the details and the legal aspects of that and, and is sorting out all of the steps. I, I just pray that you get patience in the process, but as well that you would just enable that process to go quickly, that it would be resolved that after all this time that has passed, that it would just be a, a natural progression. And uh, I just pray that you would certainly give the patience, but as well that you would uh, just open up the right doors, that all this would be resolved. Certainly for the other requests, they're still on our screen, still on our hearts, perhaps never even mentioned uh, publicly, but you are certainly aware of. I pray that you would direct, that you would provide, that you would be honored as, as we move forward. Certainly continue to pray for the Miller family, and certainly I believe just waiting out uh, this quarantine, we, we thank you for a return to health for Joe to the most part, and I just pray that as they finish out these last few days, uh, just that you'd be able to give them the, the strength, the health as they uh, adjust them back to the routines that are, are common for each of their ages. And we thank you for what you'll do there as well. And uh, for us here this morning, as we've gathered to worship you, I pray that you would do just that in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song. Then we're going to, I need to change this in our bulletin, which unless you guys, I didn't even post it this week. I realize. Well, unless you guys are uh, uh, viewing that, 
Uh, you don't know what's in the bulletin anyway, but we're going to sing a song, then we'll take the offering, and then special music and go from there. And I should change it in the bulletin because it's always awkward to finish my prayer and then call Josiah and pray immediately thereafter. So we're going to sing a song, and we'll stand as we sing Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When all its storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of my Savior Standing, standing Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by us. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of my Savior. Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all On the promises of God Standing, standing on the promises of my Savior Being stand Very good. You may be seated. Before I have Josiah come take the uh, offering, just an announcement. I know I've said this before. My sister-in-law, one of Jen's sisters, often watches our services either live with us or uh, thereafter uh, our services. And uh, she will often send me friendly critiques, as sister-in-laws do, at, at least this one. And uh, anyway, it turns out that when we do the offertories, apparently, and I know that I do this as well before the service, when my wife is, is uh, playing the piano and I'm uh, going through all of my notes and, and all of that for the service, uh, I will hum along with her. And uh, so last week, her critique was is that when it comes to the offering time, she wants to be able to hear her sister play the piano and not hear me humming. And while you may not hear me humming, obviously I'm this far from the mic, so she hears it very well. And uh, apparently that has been very distracting to her. So I thought today my wife will play silent or quietly and we could all hum if that will work. And uh, I'm just curious what she's going to say. <laughs> I, will, I will try to refrain myself from the, the humming. But if, yeah, if you want to hum, I would love to be able to reply and say, was it me? <laughs> But anyway, we're going to have Josiah come and take the uh, morning offering here this morning. And as he comes, let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for how you bless each one of us in uh, varying ways. But we thank you for each, each detail, even uh, uh, those small details that often are overlooked. We thank you for your continued goodness. And as we give this morning, I pray that we give with cheerful hearts unto you. And I ask that you would bless the offering and certainly multiply it as uh, we seek to accomplish your work here in Toulon, to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
that this time we have special music. Thank you. This morning we're going to be back in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2 this, this week as uh, we continue on. I said this last week, I don't know that we're going to go through every chapter of Deuteronomy, um, but so far we're almost going verse by verse through Deuteronomy. And uh, certainly I can say this, once we get into all the, uh, there'll be several lengths of sections in regards to uh, uh, different aspects of the law. Um, we'll probably skip, be skipping over some of those again. Not that any part of the Word of God is not important. Um, but as we're making the application for us in our journey, kind of in connection with their journey, um, uh, we wanted to be able to kind of hit some highlights as we make our way through with them. So we'll be in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2 here this morning. And uh, before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the time that we can be together uh, again, as we often prayed. I pray that you allow me to decrease so that you alone would increase. I pray that you challenge me and my words, and uh, even in my own heart, as live out uh, what I am sharing, uh, what your word says. And uh, I pray that for each one of us that you would direct us, that you would enable us to point our toes in the right direction after, as we follow after you. And uh, we give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We are, for this year's kind of theme, we're considering our, our thinking. What, what are we thinking? And uh, I think when we continue on with with uh, shutdowns and, and mass, and which uh, certainly does not seem to be to the same extent as it was before. And uh, I, I'm going to leave the politics aside, just going to make observations there. It's definitely not to the same extent as it was before, or very different. But nonetheless, as we just continue on, what was it they were saying originally, 15 days to uh, uh, flatten the curve, and uh, here we are a few more than 15 days later, and uh, still working on it. And in fact, at this point, we're still kind of, at this point, we're still going up to an extent. Um, but anyway, uh, our thinking can really get into the into play. And as we get tired, as we get frustrated or perhaps uh, uh, annoyed uh, as things continue on, continuing on, 
uh, with uh, seemingly no change on the horizon, we could say, uh, our thinking comes into great play. And how? what are we thinking about? Well, this morning, the challenge for our, our thinking is, is uh, thinking like a bull. And what I'm referring to is, uh, well, let me, let me illustrate this. In my uh, days at uh, Cherry Tree, uh, starting to add up how many years ago now that was, but working for Joe Miller, uh, one of my, my tasks, in fact, I, I believe my title was his assistant, if I recall, just be the assistant to the president, and uh, which meant that every day was a very new day of, of the task. It, it could be that he'd let me know the night before, hey, I need you in Rockford by 7 a.m. And uh, so it meant uh, early morning and get everything loaded up and drive into Rockford, which also, to my benefit, also meant Chick-fil-A, because, you know, they're Rockford and all that, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, we had, in Rockford by 7 a.m., we had to pick up this or that, and uh, you need to get to the job site, and, you know, it could be anywhere. It could be the Chicago, it could be the Quad Cities, it could be out towards Springfield. You never knew where we were heading. And, or it could be that uh, one of the uh, installers would call and say, I ran out of gas on the interstate. And uh, so here I'm hustling out the door with a gas can, heading down the interstate to go find them and help them out. Or uh, There was one or two instances where... Uh, uh, somebody would call up and say, I was just in an accident. <laughs> and I have to go kind of help them out. And, and a lot of times Joe would come with, which always meant, and I, I say this and he's not here, but he may be listening. It was always exciting times for me when Joe went because it usually involved food. And, and uh, not only that, but it usually involved him buying the food, which was always it was a double blessing. You know, I get to eat and it cost me nothing. And so it, it was a great thing. But one of the tasks that I often found myself uh, uh, doing, and I had a lot of office work as well, so it wasn't all, it wasn't all fun. <laughs> but one of the tasks that I had to uh, do there at uh, Cherry Tree was often assisting the countertop installer, who also was named Joe. And uh, many times, a few times, I should say it this way, I would be called to the task, to the job site, and to be able to remove the old countertop before installing the new. And I enjoy, demolition is probably every guy's dream job. And so that always was a fun day when I got to go and destroy something um, and then put the new one back on. And uh, most of that was, you know, countertop Joe's job, or we call him Grandpa Joe because when his daughter had already had a, a child by then. So it was Grandpa Joe and Boss Joe, uh, kind of how we differentiated between the two of them. But when we go for a granite a countertop job, and those things weighed, you know, four times what my car weighs. Uh, before we had hauled this thing out of the back of, of Countertop Joe's, Grandpa Joe's trailer, I would always get the same speech. And I verified everybody always got the same speech from, from that Joe. It was this. This is a granite countertop. It is heavy. It is breakable. And then he'd say these words, don't be a bull in a china shop. Well, let me, let me back up, and I know I probably have shared some of this before, but let me back all the way back up to high school, uh, back when I was very much in shape and uh, enjoying running and playing basketball and all that. Four years of basketball, I think I may have only had two fouls. Four full years of seasons. My brother Bob, per season, fouled out of the game probably five times practically every game. Uh, if it wasn't every game, he was getting pulled by the coach before the end of the game because he was right on the verge and didn't know if he would need him at the very end. And so we're pulling you out before you do fall out. And uh, I don't know if it was always aggression or intention or Bob's coordination, especially in high school, was not always perhaps the best. And I think there are many fouls that Bob may, may not have even anticipated following, but uh, he went one way and his arms went the other or something, and uh, uh, things happened. <laughs> well, and I know I shared this illustration before, but uh, there was one game. We were actually very close. We were just down by a, a point or two and called a timeout. My coach says, all right, whoever gets, this is the opposing team, when they get the ball in, follow them. We're going to take the gamble that they're not going to make both free throws, and then we get the, we get possession of the ball immediately, and only, you know, two seconds have gone off the clock. And uh, I've, I'd, you know, pro ball players do that all the time. I'd seen the Chicago Bulls doing that all the time. And uh, so I knew exactly what he was saying. What was going on in my head, I knew exactly what he was saying. You know, as soon as they throw the ball and the guy catches it, just, you know, foul, and the whistle gets blown, they go down there, and we're going to hope that this guy is more of a dribbler and not a shooter, and uh, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go that way out. 
Well, I recall I was one of the guards, so I was always the last one across the uh, the half court line that as the ball get thrown in, and they threw the ball to the guy right in front of me. So this is now my responsibility. And uh, remember what the rules were: as soon as they get the ball, follow him. So he gets the ball, and I am in my defense position, you know, down squatting, and my hands are are up, and I'm ready. And I hear my coach saying, "Follow him, follow him." And uh, I'm running backwards, just like this, and I'm not letting him go anywhere. I'm running backwards, my arms are up, and he's running towards me. He's getting closer to his basket, but, and I hear my coach yelling, follow him, follow And I remember, I distinctly remember looking back kind of quickly and saying, how, how do I follow? I don't know how to do this. How do I, how do I do this? I, I don't, I don't want to, and, and uh, he, he it came to a point that as my coach, I could tell he's getting mad at me, so I plant myself. And I'm ready for his guy just to charge right into me. And I'm thinking, he's going to draw the fall on me. This will work out. I don't know how to do it to him, but he'll do it to me. And so I plant myself. The guy fakes one way and he goes the other. My arm goes straight up. And apparently clotheslining somebody is not a good thing in basketball. Whoop, he went down on the ground. I got a technical. I got a Me, who's right, hollering. Now... We lost the game, and, and things didn't work out very well. You know what I was doing Monday at practice? Learning how to follow people. Yeah, that, so, so I say all that to say this. When, when Countertop Joe says, don't be like a bull in a china shop, my mind goes to, no, 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 no. That's the other brother. <laughs> I don't even know how to follow somebody in basketball. I, 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 that, that, that's not how I, I, I don't know how to do this. You know, I think completely opposite of what we were looking at last week when we many times quit before we get the job done. I think there's some, some cases in our Christian walk where we are, like, we are like a bull. The Lord commands us, this is what you should do. And like a bull in a china shop, to use uh, a Joe Keezer's uh, a motto, uh, I think a lot of times we can... Um, charge forward in obedience but I think sometimes you know the whole aspect of speaking the truth but speaking the truth in love sometimes our our attentive to obedience is such that we come across as a bull in a china shop and uh, this is the complete extreme opposite extreme from last week where we quit because we're too timid this is the where we are charging, and there are kind of like my brother charging on the basketball court. There's there's bodies <laughs> laying on both sides, but we're charging forward. Now I'm not saying that we should hesitate. I'm not saying that we should question. I'm not saying that we should slow down in our obedience. But I am saying I think there's a few times that maybe we aren't we aren't considering what it is that God has truly called us to do in our response to what what He's called us. Jude, for instance, is talking about the very reality of, of false teachers. The very reality of the impact that it will have on the church. And uh, in verse 22 of Jude, it says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. The very next verse says, And with others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now, if we were going to, and we had talked about having a bonfire next week, Sounds like we're going to be getting hot again next week. Um, but that was one of the thoughts of for our anniversary service, having a bonfire out here. Um, I think we're going to just be staying in the basement uh, for that for next week. But imagine if I am teaching Josiah how to uh, light a fire. And so I go through all the details and, you know, the kindling and, and all of that. And we often just use newspaper or old magazines or whatever and tear out the pages and crumple them up under the kindling. And you light that and the paper burns rather immediately. And then the kindling starts on fire. And then, then you start piling the heavier, bigger logs kind of gradually up on, on there on, on top. And I've certainly never been or dreamed of being a Boy Scout by any means. But I've started quite a few Quite a few fires over, over my lifespan. Imagine I'm now passing that on to Josiah, how to do that. And, uh, and so it's his turn. I showed him, I've shown him, I've shown him. I said, all right, Josiah, now it's your turn. You're going to start the next fire. And he takes these big logs, and he stacks them, and he takes a lighter, and he just tries to light these big logs. And uh, I kind of scratch my head. You know, what am I going to say in this teaching moment? What am I going to say to Josiah? Where's the kindling, Josiah? Oh, 
Now, I'm not saying that Josiah doesn't know how to barrel the fire, but in this illustration, oh, that's right, Dad. And uh, uh, so he, he corrects it. I'm not going to go rush it into the, into the scene, shoving Josiah out of the way, taking the logs and hurling them into the yard and saying, you got to start with the small stuff. Uh, that's not how you're going to have that teachable moment. Uh, I'm going to have some compassion. I'm going to use the, uh, the experience there of, of, of what's going on. But let's say that as he's trying to light this log, and I just, I just stand back thinking, this is not going to work. But I'm going to let him figure it out. So I'm going to be quiet instead of saying, you know, where's the kindling, Josiah? I'm just going to stand back. and Well, he gets one of those, you know, it's one of those logs that's got the bark that's kind of flaring up on, on one. And that, that actually lights on fire. And now I know that this isn't going to actually last. As soon as that little piece of bark that's kind of dried out and curled has, has uh, gone out, then his fire is, is done. But he lights it, and he stands back, and he's all excited because he now has a fire. Well, as he begins to realize, but well, this isn't going to last long, now he grabs a gas can. What do I do? Now, as he's in the motion of, of pouring, I am charging in, and I am shoving him out of the way. I am grabbing that can, and I'm not going to hurl it because that gas will follow. The, the, but I'm going to I'm going to run with it, and perhaps in the process, as I have put myself in between him and the fire, perhaps now my my beard and my eyebrows are now gone. My my face has gone, and and uh, uh, I've got that instant sunburn look. And uh, I am running across the yard with a gas can so it does not also catch on fire. You know, there is going to be a difference in how I teach my son on what he needs to do. The same thing is applicable in the body of Christ as we work on directing each other in the path that God has for us. And of some having compassion, making a difference, but of others, rescuing them from the, literally from the fire. And I think it's uh, our obedience is not what's in question. And many times I think it's how. How we're, how we're interacting with others as we obey God uh, really does come into play. And I want to look at a, a few points here, four points. The last two are pretty quick, so I'll, I'll give you a heads up. Four points this morning on, and I'm not trying to be, uh, who is that, Jeff Foxworthy? You might be a right neck if. Uh, uh, but this is, you might be a bull in a china shop if. Four ways that sometimes we, in our rush to obey God, which is admirable, but in our rush to obey God, we may be overlooking what God has called us to, what God is doing in and through us. Let me read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse, the first five verses. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me. And we compassed Mount Zir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward. Let me just stop right there. Recall they were already, I should have put the map back up here of, of where we're talking, but if you can see the promised land here, they have already from Egypt come up, and they're, they're right here at the bottom, right here on the border when they send the spies in, as we kind of referenced last week in chapter 1. And the spies, <laughs> this, is, this is a little more than normal, I think, or I'm louder than normal, maybe that's it. Uh, they come back with a report that people don't believe God. Uh, instead, they believe these 10 spies, and uh, the Lord ch uh, rebukes them, and uh, 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 corrects them with the 38 years of wandering. And so from that point, the promised land is to their north. The Lord sends them to the south. Can you imagine the moment when they finally get the word that now we're heading back north? We are, we are on our way back to where we need to be going. And so that's kind of the, 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 the background of where we're going. Verse 3, long enough to turn you northward. And commanded thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coasts of your brother and the children of Esau, which dwell in Sierra, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Remember, therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to see what therefore is there for. Why are they to take good heed unto themselves? Because the people there of Zier are going to be afraid of them. Verse 5, meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breadth. Because I have given Mount Zier unto Esau for a possession. I, I've said and I've called this uh, current generation that we are living in the, the selfie generation. Uh, as, as we become more and more, as I have there on the screen, more and more you focus. And I'm not trying to beat a, a dead horse, but I'm afraid that that horse is still not dead. It's still running rather free, even among Christianity today, as we have been 
uh, uh, caught up in the me movement uh, of today. And I think we need to be very cautious of that me movement of, of today. I'm not saying that well, he took a selfie, so he's definitely him. No, but we got to be cautious of the mentality of, of the, the selfie generation. Do you recall, and I know that uh, perhaps even my kids don't even know what I'm talking about when I say this, but there was a time that uh, families would have slides <laughs> of their vacations, or uh, even at best, uh, uh, printed pictures uh, of their vacation. How did you know who took the picture back then? They <laughs> were in it, that's right. You look back at old pictures, oh, Grandpa must have taken this one because I see the rest of the family, but there's no Grandpa. He must have been the photographer in this case. Isn't it amazing how that's how things went? Uh, uh, now, many pictures of today, it's just us. You know, if, you're, if you go somewhere, it's a picture of just you and the surroundings. Whereas it used to be, I'm going to take a picture of my family, my friends, and their surroundings, and I'm not even in the picture. Or when you have the group selfie or whatever, the groupie, whatever the, whatever the phrase is there, uh, where is the person, where's the photographer? It's usually still front and center. You know, they might be on the end and everybody else is there next to them. Uh, uh, but as far as the, the, the photo shot goes, it, the, the, the focus is still where? It's still on us. And I'm, again, I'm not saying there's a condemnation for taking pictures in that way. But I do believe that it is a clear indication of how, and there's many other indications, but a clear indication of how our mindset has changed less of them and more of me. Uh, like perhaps it never has before. And, and we were told this was going to happen. But we've got to be cautious as far as our response in how it interacts even within the body of Christ today. Uh, people will become more self-centered. But that doesn't give us a, a due cause to also do the same. Again, this is not about how you take pictures. This is about how we think, how we live. And, and let, let me follow through with the, these five verses here. After leaving the border of the Promised Land, as I already said, they left Kadesh Barnea. They've gone southward. Now they're heading northward. And uh, uh, certainly after 38 years, I've got to think there had to have been a little rejoicing when the word comes out, hey, we're turning. We're heading back. Now, it's not going to be a direct route, but we're heading back. If this was an airplane, it would be after you know, 38 years of, of circling the runway, you finally hear the, the pilot come on and say, hey, we've been given clearance. Please be seated, fasten your seatbelts. We're landing. And you hear that finally after, and it's certainly not 38 years, but you've, you've, you've been in the air for two hours even, and you finally hear the words, we've been given clearance to land. What happens? Oh. Well, imagine 37 years, they're given the command that, or they're given the statement, hey, we're, we're, we're heading back. We're heading back in that right direction. And uh, we conclude then with these five verses, and it says, Hey, take heed, because these inhabitants of Seir, Seir, actually, I think believes how you say that, are, are, are uh, relatives, offspring of Esau, and take heed how you handle yourself. Genesis chapter 36, verse 1 says, Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Verse 20, or chapter 25, verse 30 says, And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray you, remember, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore his name was called Edom. The very next verse, Jacob, the slightly younger twin, trades his older brother's birthright for a pot of stew. And uh, certainly the, the relationship between those two brothers becomes greatly hampered from that point forward. Uh, continuing on, verse 21 for through 24 of Genesis 25, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren, and the Lord entreated him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? If you Lord, if you're blessing me, why is what is going on? Well, this, this doesn't seem right. And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Genesis chapter 7, we recall, Rebekah does some crafty craft projects and uh, somehow makes her basically hairless Jacob hairy so that uh, 
uh, the, the difference to a blind man isn't known between the two twins. And the blessing is cast to the wrong twin, as we would say it in human terms. Jumping farther ahead, Genesis chapter 36, it says, And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob, for the riches were more than that they might dwell together. The land in wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Deuteronomy here, chapter 2, God says, I have given Mount Seir to Esau, and not only that, but you, descendants of Jacob, will not even get a foot of it. But they will be very afraid of you, therefore guard yourselves. In other words, be right by them. Now, now listen carefully. If, if, uh, if you know that someone is a, afraid of you, how, what is the easy connotation of, of your response to them? Obviously, you, many times it's very easy to take advantage of them. And I know I'm jumping a couple points here. Well, you don't know that, but I do know that. Uh, it's easy to take advantage of them because we know their fear, because we know that uh, uh, you know, you, you, you flinch at them and, and uh, they'll do what, what, what you need. But the Lord says, hey, guard yourself. If you are you focused, what would Israel have done when they heard that, hey, you're, the first land that you're going to go through is you're heading back north? They're very afraid of you. <laughs> this is jackpot. No, God says, be cautious. Be careful. Watch what you are doing. Do not meddle with them. This is important. Don't be focused on you. Realize that there's other yous <laughs> involved. And those other yous, Y-O-Us, not lambs or whatever, but those other yous are there because I put them there. You know what's easy to do as we go about life is to forget that God is also working in other people's lives. That God is also doing a work in their heart as he's doing a work in ours. And, and many times we, it's easy, I think, to see others as sometimes people that are just in the way. And uh, we're moving forward and, and they're kind of in the way and we're just going to uh, part the sea, so to speak, as we move forward for the Lord. Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is that sometimes there are others that God is doing a work. And how often we become disruptive in our response in their life. Guard yourself. Hey, they're afraid of you, but don't take advantage of that. Which leads me to the, the second point here, kind of going back to verse 4 again. But you might be a bull in a china shop, not only if you are you focused, but if you are claiming those advantages. In our home, I probably have said this as well, and I don't know how our dog keeps getting in the conversation of sermons. I, don't, I, don't, I guess we got a dog just so I would have more sermon illustrations and not have to embarrass my children. I'll embarrass my dog, and he doesn't know the difference. But in our home, we have a uh, little dog, and our son, Matt, who's been at the uh, Wilds ever since he graduated from college, um, he and our dog don't seem to get along. Not necessarily because of our dog, but more so because of Matt. And Matt knows that. We all know that. Becca knows that. Um, but here's how things go when Matt comes home from, from his visit from the Wilds. The dog will be, as he often is, very excited. Someone's in our home, and he'll be jumping and barking and tail will be wagging and this i kid you not this is what matt will do and that poor dog tail goes straight down and he goes cowering and uh matt will continue to talk to us and eventually that dog will get up the courage to come back out and he'll come out slowly now he's he's keeping an eye on matt and uh, matt you know he, the dog might even be behind him and uh the dog will slowly be coming back out you know to people kind of like a, a cat finally coming out of his hiding spot and uh, Matt won't even be noticing, but out of the corner of the eye, he sees the dog finally getting his courage up. And uh, in the middle of conversation, he'll just go, just stomp his foot. And that poor dog, whoop, and he's gone again. And you know, he'll run into our bedroom and hide under our bed. I, I guess that's the most secure place in our home, under my bed. It's not his room, but it's his security, I guess. And that's how the, that's how the two, in, inside, I think it's because Matt, always wanted a dog growing up and he never we never had one until he was out of the house inside i think it's a jealousy thing that's what i'm thinking that's what we've come to the conclusion but anyway he and the dog normally do
do not get along because of Matt. And Matt will acknowledge. If Matt were here today, he'd, he'd say, yep, <laughs> it's, it's all me. Because he'll scare the daylights out of that dog on purpose. Now, let me also back up and give you a side story about this dog. This is Becca's dog. She's definitely claimed 100% of that dog. If any of the rest of us did that, oh my goodness, she would literally, she would kick me out of my own home if I did that to her dog. Matt does it. Nothing. Not a word. She might complain to us after Matt leaves. I wish Matt wouldn't be like but not a word to Matt. She'll laugh. She'll carry on with Matt. But inside, I know this is eating her up, which is probably another reason why Matt does that. Well, you know how easy it is to take advantage of others. Again, let me read verse 4. And he commanded all the people, saying, You are to pass through the coast of your brother and the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take you good heed unto yourselves therefore. Manipulation is a easy reality for child and adult. When we take advantage of others because we know we can get what we want. It's not just about naughty kids, although kids many times excel at it. But I'm afraid that many times as adults, we, uh, we, we, we still got some, we still got some uh, uh, key points in our back pocket on how to do this pretty well. As we, we can manipulate others, we can take advantage of, we'll, to use the same word, their fear. We take advantage of their love. We'll take advantage of their desire uh, of, of, uh, of, of even just plain goodness and we'll use that to our advantage. They fear us. <laughs> Why shouldn't we be using that to our advantage? Let me continue on. Uh, verse 5, meddle not with them, for I will not give you other land, no, not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Ye shall buy meat of them for money that you may eat, and ye shall also buy water of them for money, that you may drink. For the Lord, here's the reasoning, verse 7, for the Lord thy God hath blessed thee and all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness these forty years. The Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. Now, what is going to be the normal human inclination of people who are in fear? Let's, let's go back to Joe Miller. He's not here, so I'll, I'll pick on him. Now, obviously, everybody knows I'm very good friends with Joe. Worked with the guy, <laughs> and we're still very good friends. Might have been because he kept buying me food. Maybe that was the deal. But let's just say, let's, let's turn the table. Let's put a whole different personality on Joe. Let's say he was one of those bosses that nobody liked. And uh, I had a great fear of Joe. Joe spoke, everybody jumps, including myself. So yeah, that's the working environment that I am now working at at, at Cherry Tree in, in this illustration. Well, how easy is it for Joe to take advantage of that? Very easy, right? He's going to start speaking and just to watch people jump. He, whatever he... No, this microphone. No, it's I'm thirsty. Well, what am I doing? What would you like, my lord? <laughs> my, my boss... My, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm my master. What, 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 what would you like? Shall I make you something? Shall I go run and buy you something? What would you, you know, if, if someone, how easy is that to take advantage? How easy is it to manipulate when we know that I speak, others jump? That's a pretty easy thing to do. How easy would it be as a nation of Israel is coming through a land of people that fear them, what do you think they're going to be doing when this nation gets thirsty? Please, whatever you want, just don't hurt us. You, you, you're thirsty, please have some water. You, you're hungry, well, go ahead, take my, take my cattle in the field. Whatever you, please just don't hurt me. You, you, what is God telling them specifically? He, do, he doesn't say, don't steal from them. He doesn't say, be nice and ask politely and say, thank you. What he says is, you will. You will buy this with money. You will treat them in this way. You have an advantage over them. They fear you, but you will not take advantage of that fear. 
You will buy with money. Why? Not because it's just the right thing to do. Why? Because I am the Lord your God, and I have been with you, and I have blessed you, and I have, I have multiplied you, and it's the why is because of me, God says. Hey, if, if you're claiming that those advantages, if you have that mentality of always manipulating, you are that bull in the china shop. When you choose to obey our God and his commands, more than likely, if you are one who takes advantage of others, you are that bull in the china shop in your obedience to your God. Be cautious with that. Thirdly, verses 8 and 9. Obviously, you're going to be a bull in a china shop if you're the one looking for a fight. Verse 8. And when we have passed by from our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from... Oh, and here we have some great places to go through. Alath, and from Ezion Geber, who he turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given ar unto the children of Lot, for a possession. Now, can you just step back for a moment? You've traveled now probably about 37 years because they still have to get back up uh, uh, to where they're going to be in real time as Moses is sharing this with them right on again at the border of the promised land. But at this moment in, in the replay of history, as Moses is reminding them, that here they are heading back north and it's time for them to realize that the battle is yet ahead for them. But here's the thing, it's not at the moment. Going through this first land, they fear you. You will treat them right. You will buy your water from them. You will buy your meat from them. You will treat them right. Don't take advantage of them. And then as you go into the next land, again, these are going to be descendants of yours. You will, again, we could carry on the same thought, you will treat them right. But here's what you're going to do. You're not going to meddle with them. We're dealing with lots of offspring. Distress, verse 9 says, distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. That word distress is, uh, uh, means do not use hostility towards others. The word contend is the same word translated as meddle that we already looked at in verse 5. When we do all that we can to cause fear and uh, fighting, Matt, you stamp his foot on the ground with our poor little puppy. Don't distress them. And don't contend with them. The children of Israel in that moment are living among the offspring of those who completely, completely failed in their time. Let me re-say that. The children who are hearing this, the children that are doing this in real time, in this memory, are the offspring of those who completely failed. And that's why they've wandered. Now the children have a name to make for themselves. Would they step up and do what was right? Would they follow through and do what God commanded them to do? Would they be the ones that would enable them to go into the promised land? Or would they also be, like their parents, dead as they wandered again for another 40 years? Would they do what was right? Well, here's the point. In order to do what was right, for their God, even though battle was yet ahead for them, that battle was not there for them in that moment. And I know that there's a lot of things that we are to contend for. We're told, in fact, to contend for the faith, right? We're to take a stand. We're to be bold. We're not to back down on the matters of, of, of faith at all. And the idea of contending, while not specifically a battle word there, does, does hint at the reality of, of that result of a battle as we contend for the faith. And might I add, as we're getting closer to the return of Christ, this battle of contending is going to be a lot more difficult for us. But we also have to remind ourselves is that I think at times it's easy for us to lose sight of who is in the battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against each other. The battle isn't with one another. This isn't Republicans versus Democrats. It's not conservatives versus liberals. This is not my view versus your view. Our battle is not with one another. The Lord says, hey, there's going to be contending. There is a, there, there is a by definition, there is a, a battle that is undoubtedly going to break out here in that regard. 
uh, as you contend for what is right, as the very idea of contending means there's going to be resistance. There's going to be, there, there's going to be a temptation to not contend for the faith. But we have to remind ourselves to whom the battle is with. It's not with each other. And we might be a bull in a china shop if we're the ones that are always looking for a fight. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to, and I don't even know, I assume it's still around. But many years ago now, a, uh, a blog, back when blogs were very popular, uh, Sharper Iron started. And I don't know what it's like now, but I know when it first started as a, as a blog, it was, supposed to, it was based on the thought of Iron Sharpens Iron. Very admirable, very biblical. But I remember a lot of that was taking place on that blog when it at least initially started. And again, I don't know where they are now. It was a lot of, uh, a lot of fighting, a lot of uh, uh, me versus you's going on. And I remember reading several articles at first, and I thought, this is, this is neither encouraging nor edifying. This is, this is just a lot of very smart people trying to show each other how smart they are, and they're just making battles over everything. One person says something that is going to get ripped apart by 300 other people, and, and this, this, this is not, I, I don't think this is what we're supposed to be doing here. Well, you know, you're going to be a bull in a china shop if you're that one that's always looking for a fight. You're always, hey, here we are. We're ready to battle. We're going to show what our parents didn't do. We are willing to do. Let's go get them. God says, whoa, <laughs> not this group. Don't meddle with them. Don't contend with them. Lastly, very quickly, uh, beginning in verse 13. Now rise up, said I, and get you out over the brook of Zered. And we went over the brook Zered. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we came across over the brook Zered was 30 and 8 years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the hosts as the Lord swore unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the hosts until they were consumed. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and the dead from among the people that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar the coast of Moab this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of the Am and distress them not, here we got a third group, neither meddle with them as I will give not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. Do you know, does anything jump out of you as I've read those several verses in regards to a description of the people of Israel? What does God call them? Let me reread it, at least parts of it, and I'll, I'll emphasize it so you can, if you're following along with me. Verse 14, in the space in which we uh, came out of Kadesh Barnina until we took, uh, come over the brook of Zered was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host. Uh, let's see, when is it? The verse 16. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and the dead from among the people. God is calling them, what? The men of war. Now, there's irony. I'm not going to say that God is being sarcastic here, but in human terms, this is pretty sarcastic, I think. What was it that they didn't do? Go to war. They were the ones that were supposed to be going to war. They were the ones that were supposed to cross on the promised land and, and uh, take the land as the Lord had given it to them. And God had already told them there was going to be battle to be given, but I will give you the battle. What did they do? God hates us. He brought us here to destroy us. Our own children are going to become prey to our enemies. We can't do this. And they go on a punishment march of 38, from that point, 38 years and God calls them now, what? Men of war. Now, I'm going to call this last point. You might be a bull in a china shop if you're missing the point. Here, here's, here's where they were missing the point. Now, granted, they did have, uh, uh, I forget, was it? It might have even been the Ammonites at that one point after they had left uh, 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 the Mount with the Ten Commandments. They, they were attacked from behind, recall? Almost seems like that might have been a group from, from Ammon. Uh, but anyway, they, so they obviously had faced battle, but as far as I know, that was for the most part their own battle. They, they were pursued a couple of times, and, and uh, they ran kind of like our dog with, with their tail between their legs and running for cover. Uh, uh, but really, to a point, they really haven't proven themselves as men of war. But there's a reason why God called them men of war. 
I'm not saying I have all the answers, but here's what I believe. In my thinking, we are either fighting the battle with God or against God. And for 38 years, well, let me say it this way, for the two years before the 38 years, for the 40 years, they have proven themselves to not be at war with what God intended them to be at war with. They were at war many times with God. God, you brought us out here to kill us. God, you, you hate us. Lord, it would be better for us if we were back in Egypt. How could that be better for you back in Egypt? But in their minds, it would be better. Why? Because God has brought us out here to kill us off. They are going to murmur. They are going to complain. Even Moses himself would not believe and trust God as he ought to and disobey God in his own frustration. Who is it that we are fighting when we do the same? It's not our circumstance. We're not fighting our circumstance. You can't fight a circumstance. We are fighting our God. Now, I don't know if that's why he called them the mind of war. Uh, I, think it, I think it's ironic. In fact, when I read that, I kind of even chuckled. Wait, he just called them men of war. These guys have been marching in the wilderness for 38 years as each one of them died off because they wouldn't obey God in going into battle. But they were men of war. The very ones that Moses is telling this to, they would become the men of war. They would be the ones that would go to battle. They would be the ones, although not always victorious, they would be the ones that would go in and face the enemy, and in most cases, except in the cases of sin, would be victorious because, as God said, I will give you this battle. They became men of war. But these others, the dead ones, I have to ask myself, how often is it that my battle, oh, I'm fighting the fight, that's eh, probably not the right fight. <laughs> I'm contending for the faith. What is it that you're contending for? You know, we, we have a, 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 the basics of what we're supposed to be doing for our God, but we're, we're kind of missing the point here. And we become men of war, but we haven't entered the right battle yet. And, and that's not how this, this works. Again, to go back to a basketball illustration, this is like the... The, those on the sidelines getting into a fight on the side. Well, wait a minute. You're not even playing the game. This is, this is, not, this is not how this is supposed to work. The, the battle is out there on the court, five guys versus five guys. You in the stands or even the rest of the team on the bench, that's not where the battle takes place. That's not, this is not what this is about. There's a team against a team trying to be victorious, and only one can be victorious. That's where the quote-unquote battle is, but here we are fighting in the stands. Now, unfortunately, a lot of times I fear that's what takes place in Christianity today. I think it goes back to because we're you-focused, me-focused. It's all about me today. We begin to claim our advantages. We have that mentality of looking for a fight. And uh, in the process of those three, we begin to miss the point. And in the words of Joe Kieser, one, I can't believe, number one, that I've used my dog as an illustration as many times as I had. Now I am quoting Joe Kieser in a sermon. In the words of Joe Kieser, don't be a bull in a china shop. It's, it's, it's not productive. Let's serve our God wholeheartedly, fervently, with great zeal. But let's not be a bull. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your, your word. We thank you for the example of the children of Israel. We thank you for the lessons we can learn of their example. I pray that you challenge us even here this week as we consider what you have for us, what you have before us, even the trials that we will face. And I pray that we be reminded of, of the battle that we are in, the struggle that we do have, what we are to be contending for and fighting for. And I pray that as we face those circumstances, even as we perhaps even this week, unfortunately at times, even have to face some people that are, are maybe difficult to deal with this week. I pray that you would remind us what it is that you've called us to, where our focus, our energy, where our fight, so to speak, must be rooted. And I pray that you would use us in great and mighty ways as with compassion we have a chance to make a difference. 
but as well as we have those opportunities at times to literally dive in and rescue those with great force at times right out of the fire. But I pray that you would use us in both of those circumstances that we'd be able to know and follow after you through it all. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to close with the last song, and as my wife comes, just a reminder that we, we do have lunch downstairs. It's been a while, so I wanted to remind you of that. But we have some lunch and then a short service downstairs. We want to sing, May the Mind of Christ, before, uh, before we head down. May the mind of Christ, my Savior, live in me from day to day, by his love and power controlling all I do and say. Let's stand as we sing, verse 1 and 2. May the mind of Christ God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour. All may see I triumph only through his power. If you know Joe Keezer, and I know at least you do, uh, if you know Joe Keezer there in Wyoming, and uh, you let it slip that I've used his quote all throughout the whole sermon, just know that and I do like Joe, and I think he likes me. He is the kind of guy that he will send me a bill for his use of his name and his quote. So just understand that if that gets passed on it, and I'm speaking to Joe Miller too, who may be watching right now. Joe Miller, where's the camera? Whatever camera I'm supposed to be looking at. Joe Miller, if you let Joe Keezer know, and he sends me a bill, I am passing it on to you. That, that's, that's for all of us. <laughs> well, let's not be a bull uh, this weekend, regardless of what the Lord sends our way. And uh, feel free to quote Joe Keezer all you want this week. Well, let's pray. We love you. Thank you again for who you are. We thank you, even at times when we don't know how to thank you in the moment, but we thank you for those trials, for those circumstances, for those difficult times where we are able to learn of you. We're able to understand and even learn of ourselves and to be able to see where you are working and how you are working and how you are molding. And at times, see our vulnerabilities to see our own sin. And I pray that we be able to get through those times, even this week, if you allow it, uh, we'd be able to get through those circumstances to your honor and to your glory. I would be able to even endure those tribulations and being able to bless others even in the, may, in the meantime. And we thank you for those opportunities this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.